Greetings, everyone. My name is David Ouellette, and I'm an associate professor of art history and the co-chair of the art program here at COD. I'd like to welcome you to our third Visiting Artist Series event for the 2021-2022 season. The Visiting Artist Series is a collaboration between the Cleve Carney Museum of Art and the Departments of Art, Architecture, and Photography here at College of DuPage. As a reminder, this and all of our events are archived on the Cleve Carney Museum of Art website, which you can find at www.theccma.org, and that the artist is present in our live stream chat today. So please join us there with your questions. Before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge that as the descendant of settlers, I live, work, and study as a guest on, on the unceded and occupied ancestral homelands of the Kickapoo, Peoria, Potawatomi, Miami, Sioux, Fox, and Sauk peoples who were subjected to the harmful policies of forced removal, eradication, and re-education by the United States government and its colonial enterprises. This land acknowledgement is a gesture of respect and gratitude to the past, present, and future Native peoples that continue to steward this land and its water. I hope it encourages others to stand in solidarity with Native peoples in this country and around the world and their struggle for reconciliation, sovereignty, and land restoration. Today, I have the pleasure of being joined by Dee Rosen, a Chicago-based artist who explores human and non-human entanglements and care ethics through a multi-sensory aesthetic. Rosen operates from the position that questions of animality are not binary, but rather a tangle of ecologies and richly complicated identities, which are framed by culture. Dee received a BFA from the Milwaukee Institute of Art and Design in 2011 and an MFA from the University of Chicago in 2013 and was an artist in residence at Skohegan School of Painting and Sculpture in 2018. Their work has been exhibited in many group and solo exhibitions, including the recent exhibitions and Echo She Is at Chicago Manual Style and The Intuitive Language of an Extended Hand at Julius Caesar Gallery. Currently, Rosen's work is on display at the Rowe Galleries at UNCC and at Roots and Culture in Chicago. So please join me in welcoming Dee Rosen. Um, thank you for having me. First, I'd like to start by thanking David Ouellette for the invitation and the Cleve Carney Museum of Art, along with the team at DuPage College for hosting this talk. Within my practice, I am often in positions where the symbiosis of violence and care is felt or made visible. Examining how violence leaves impressions on the bodies of humans and non-human animals, as well as various forms of matter, requires that I critically interrogate the ways that I enact and am complicit in violence on various scales. As a white person and human animal living in a settler colonialist, white supremacist, cis heteropatriarchal capitalist and anthropocentric society. I want to take a moment to acknowledge that this talk is taking place on the unceded and occupied lands of the Ottawa, Ojibwe, Ojibwe Miami, Peoria, Kickapoo, Kaskaskia and Powatomi nations, commonly known as Chicago, Illinois. I humbly stand in solidarity with indig indigenous people throughout the world and support land back movements as a way to not only acknowledge that we are living on stolen land, but to return the land to the people who have and continue to endure the many violences of colonization. This talk is based on a paper that I wrote titled Chrysanthemum Powder and Other Interspecies Scent Rituals. The full text will be published in the forthcoming Rutledge volume titled Olfactory Art and the Political in an Age of Resistance edited by Gwen Allen and Deborah Riley Parr. Throughout the talk, I explore scent as a tool for interspecies care, and will discuss those metaphorical intersections with my artistic practice. Images of non-human animals, collaborators, and friends, as well as images of my work will scroll in the background. My primary ethical concern is to prioritize interspecies care within fraught conditions of domestication that uphold capitalist systems of extraction. Rejecting binary distinctions between species is vital to establishing frameworks of care in contexts where beings are treated as property for extractive ends. Scent-based interactions can serve as a means of establishing trust or repulsion between beings across species. Ultimately, my hope is that expanded frameworks for kinship 
might allow beings to build less violent, more caring worlds that center divorce sensoria. In the Undercommon, Stefano Harney and Fred Moten explore ways of thinking with and reading with. They use a deeply collaborative model to highlight the inevitability of entanglement. Scent is one form of thinking with beings. Plants, non-human animals, bacteria, and many organisms physically participate in the making of scents. Non-human animals also transmit and receive scents as communicative signals to other members of their species. Anna Lohenhot Singh talks about smell as a form of entanglement in Mushroom at the End of the World on the possibility of life in capitalist ruin. Singh explains that smell is elusive and that describing smell is almost as difficult as describing air. Yet smell is distinct from air, according to Singh, because it signals an encounter with another. Singh asks, might smell in its confusing mix of elusiveness and certainty be a useful guide to the indeterminacy of encounter? To elaborate on how smell sets the stage for the indeterminacy of encounter, I will spend some time exploring how animals are mutually entangled in the production and reception of scents. Within my work, I deploy a queer methodology to explore how scent permeates the lives of animals, both human and non-human. Jack Halberstam explains that a queer methodology in a way is a scavenger methodology that uses different methods to collect and produce information on subjects who have been deliberately or accidentally excluded from traditional studies of human behavior. Queer or scavenger methodologies highlight the inevitability of entanglement or reading with. In addition, non-human scavengers such as rats, pigeons, coyotes, feral cats, and mice have been some of my best teachers. Scavengers are resourceful and have learned to flourish in contexts that often attempt to exterminate, displace, starve, or harass them. In the second half of this talk, I will describe a few gestures of mutual care between animals that form the foundation of my artistic practice. Using care as a framework for both thought and ethical motivation, I aim to provide examples of how scent can be a tool for working with non-human animals across various contexts shaped by the carceral structures of domestication and capitalist extraction. My experiences on urban and rural working farms, artist residencies, and farm sanctuaries over four years have informed this work. Using encounters with non-human animals as a guide, I explore how scent can be used in rituals of interspecies care and as a tool to celebrate diverse sensoria. When thinking about scent as a form of interspecies entanglement, it is important to discuss materials that have been extracted from the bodies of non-human animals and used throughout history as fixatives for perfumes. Richard Stamelman describes the sites of extraction for these scents in the arrows and thantos of scents. Stamelman explains that many of the scents originating in the bodies of non-human animals were extracted from glands or sacs near the animal's sexual organs. Civet comes from the Ethiopian cat, musk from the Tibetan deer, castorium from the abdomen of the beaver, and ambergris with no anatomical sexual connection from the intestinal lining of the sperm whale. Human animals have used the sexual excretions of non-human animals to fix our animal pleasures. Why do human animals feel compelled to extract scent from the glands or pheromones of other species to perfume our bodies? It might be easy to assume that the fecal or musky odors extracted from the sexual organs of non-human animals are used as mating signals. However, the research regarding the role that scent plays within human animal desire is largely unresolved. As biologist D. Michael Stoddart explains, research into whether human body odors play any part in human sexual behavior has been largely inconclusive. Yet the role of odors in the sexual physiology of non-human primates and other mammals is sufficiently clear for there to be a very strong possibility that they do indeed play some role in our own species. However mysterious our human animal olfactory desires might be, it is clear that scent plays a role in our lives and within the lives of non-human animals. Like scent, queer animals do not often settle within fixed categories or corporeal expressions of desire. In Queer Smells, Mark Graham describes the queer performativity of scent. Graham writes, 
Desires that are olfactory, but also oral and tactile, may be less easy to compartmentalize and less amenable to a rigid heteronormative and homonormative categorization of gender and sexuality than a distant disembodied participation through the visual. If more attention were paid to scent, Graham argues, the ubiquity of queer desires may emerge. The queerness of scent is not limited to the domain of human animal desires. Fruit flies use scent to scramble categories of gender and sex. In Evolution's Rainbow, Joan Roughgarden explains, some insect species have females that synthesize male perfumes. During mating, a male fruit fly transfers an anti-aphrodisiac to the female. Although most evaporates four to six hours after the first mating, females later synthesize this compound themselves during courtships, making them less attractive to males. Butterflies also use anti-aphrodisiacs. The most extensive studies of masculine females come from insects. Female masculinity is contextualized by Jack Halberstam as one form of gender deviance that opens up space to think in fractal terms about gender geometries. Imagine the kaleidoscopic identifications and exchanges that may arise from a queer refashioning of scent. The playful fashioning of a unique scent profile is one way of defining corporeal beauty for oneself beyond the binaries of gender or species. Scent can expand the sensory territory of non-human animals living in conditions of confinement and sensory repression. In Animal Madness, Laurel Breitman describes how perfume has been used in zoo enrichment programs. Enrichment programs were developed because non-human animals subject to the carceral conditions within zoos often become depressed. Self-harming behaviors along with disordered eating and other unhealthy patterns of behavior become coping mechanisms for confined non-human animals. As part of the enrichment program at the Bronx Zoo, cheetahs spend more time exploring their enclosure when sprayed with Calvin Klein's obsession cologne for men. Scent is used to engage non-human animals whose territory and lives have been truncated for the purposes of human animal entertainment. As Ellen Byron elaborates in the Wall Street Journal, Zoos have long spritzed perfume and cologne on rocks, trees, and toys in an effort to keep confined animals curious. Anne Gottlieb, the nose who helped create Obsession for Men, describes the appeal. It's a combination of this lickable vanilla heart married to this fresh green top note. It creates tension, she says. The cologne also has synthetic animal notes like civet, a musky substance secreted by the cat of the same name giving it particular sex appeal, she adds. It sparks curiosity with humans and apparently non-human animals. Creating a richly scented enclosure opens up space for non-human animals. Scent expands the artificially narrow limits of their sensory territory. Although it may seem indulgent to buy designer cologne for cheetahs, it is the least we can do for beings that we have permanently confined. I agree wholeheartedly with Che Gossett's argument for widespread abolition. On Verso, Gossett writes, abolition is the unfinished project of ending anti-Black racism, racial capitalism, anti-trans, anti-queer, patriarchal policing, colonialism, animal killing, and caging. Animal liberationists must confront the devaluation of Black life and racialization as animalization and the prison industrial complex as a part of a movement for abolition. In less systemic context, scent is a tool used between animals to mark territory and signal presence. As Jacob von Uxel explains in a foray into the worlds of animals and humans, scent plays a role in the social and environmental relations between non-human animals. The biologist very clearly details how dogs use scent to mark their territory. Dogs mark over one another's scent and their markings are visible to the human eye. However, in some cases, as Uxel describes, a timid dog may go bashfully past the odor marks of a strange dog in that dog's territory and through no odor sign betray their own presence. Scent allows animals to make our presence known or not even after we have left the physical site of encounter. While working on an Icelandic sheep farm in Vermont, I experimented with scent as a tool to mark human-animal territory in order to repel a bear. 
Within one week after my arrival on the farm, the bear had killed Blossom, a retired milking sheep who was blind, along with a lamb ram. After the bear killed Blossom and the lamb ram, the farmer hired local hunters to shoot the bear. Independently, out of concern for the bear who was being hunted and in search of nonviolent solutions to conflict, I began to explore scent-based tools to repel predators. Human urine and hair are often used by gardeners to keep non-human animals, such as deer and rabbits, from eating their vegetables. However, the National Park Service advises against that method because the smell of human bodily waste may attract large predators, such as bears. Pine oil, bleach, and ammonia are among the few smells that could be used to deter bears. There is also the possibility of using scents such as blackberry bait oils and other sweet syrupy odors to lure the bear into a live trap. Once the bear was caught, they would have to be released over 20 miles away from the farm, outside of their range of smell, to prevent another attack. Bears possess a sense of smell that is 100 times stronger than human animals. It became clear through research that scent was more often a scrumptious invitation than a warning or repugnant barrier. Using scent as a lure and repellent was also a factor in a 2019 exhibition where I collaborated with mice living in the porous building of the Chicago gallery, Julius Caesar. For the exhibition, the intuitive language of an extended hand, I built a plinth out of flock blocks. The piece was titled Nourishment is a Plinth in Repose. The flock blocks used to construct the work are typically designed for laying hens. Most laying hens have been bred to overproduce, which leaves their bodies calcium deficient and causes them to cannibalize their eggs. Flock blocks contain sunflower seeds, corn, molasses, and oyster shells, along with minerals. The oyster shells supplement the diets of hens, aid in digestion, and deter hens from eating their eggs. These blocks have a salty, earthy, and tangy bouquet. The blocks lured a mouse friend, whom I named Seed, and later an entire crew of mice into the space. Over the course of the exhibition, the mice gnawed through the center of the sculpture, tunneling cavities through the blocks. At the end of the exhibition, the seed blocks were donated to the Chicago Chicken Rescue as planned. Of course, the mice were still looking to the site as an abundant food source and began to wreak ravenous havoc in the gallery. To usher my mice collaborators out of the space, I laced the perimeter of the gallery with peppermint oil as a repellent. Dual aspects of scent were used in this collaborative process, both to feed new friends and to signal that the feast was over. Scent can serve as both a lure and repellent to signal territorial boundaries, mark presence, and affect social interactions between species. Much like the process of working with scent in all of its ephemeral romance, working with non-human animals reveals the union of love and death. Working with, caring with, and grieving with non-human animals across contexts means frequently confronting the death of one's non-human friends through rapid cycles of slaughter, predation, genetics, and illness. The interrelationship of love, death, and scent is put into words by Samelman, who writes, Scent gives voice to the evanescent spaces into which words cannot venture. One such space of inexpressibility is love and death. Unlike love, death smells. Political scientist Timothy Packerat experienced the many smells of death while working in an industrial slaughterhouse in Omaha, Nebraska. In his book, Every 12 Seconds, Packerat explains that within industrial slaughterhouses, Mechanisms of distance are created to reinforce racial, gender, citizenship, and education hierarchies that coerce others into performing dangerous, demeaning, and violent tasks from which consumers directly benefit. It is important when talking about the ethics of treating non-human animals as commodities to illustrate clearly how the violence directed at non-human animals also negatively affects the lives of humans. Throughout the United States, the unsavory effects of slaughterhouses disproportionately affect people of color, especially undocumented people of color, who are underpaid to perform violent and dangerous work. Industrial waste leaks into the ground and has been sprayed on the houses of Black communities in North Carolina. Those who live near slaughterhouses often endure the long-term physical and emotional impacts of environmental racism. 
In addition to clearly outlining the inherent racism within the division of physical labor and the panoptic working conditions of the slaughterhouse, Packeret also describes the way that smell pervades the bodies of workers. The smells of death clearly mark those who work on the clean side and those who work on the dirty side of the slaughterhouse. Those who are assigned some of the most taxing and dirty labor of fabrication work in the paunch opening room. When the cow's stomachs are cut open, a thick odor escapes. A combination of the acrid smell of vomit and the sulfuric stench of rotting eggs. The humid air mixes with the scent of human sweat, which adds to the already heady olfactory mix. Those who work in the paunch opening room carry the smells of their labor on their bodies into the locker room, where those who work in other sections of the slaughterhouse hold their breath. By performing the labor of extraction, slaughterhouse workers are perfumed with the smells of death. The smell of their work affects their social relations, even within the slaughterhouse itself. The bodies of humans and non-human animals are impacted by extractive processes. In her book, Cow with Ear Tag 1389, Catherine Gilseppe cites A. Breeze Harper's important work titled Cysta Vegan. Both authors examine the correlations between systemic racism and speciesism. The violence that is enacted through capitalistic extraction devalues life and foregrounds property or the ownership of living beings. Gilseppe asks human animals to critically examine how forms of injustice mutually reinforce each other, and through reflection, how we may develop less violent and oppressive ways of living and being in relation with others. Christopher Sebastian also writes cogently about the necessity of examining systemic violence when he states, this is not a comparison of human animals to non-human animals. This is a comparison of like systems of oppression. Ending domestication and enslavement begins with the philosophical re-examination of all carceral systems that historically have confined both humans and non-human animals. It means examining how our pleasures are produced, who is impacted in the process, and how our deathly procedures of extraction are deodorized, physically and conceptually, for our sterilized consumption. Care is not often seen as a value within capitalist economies that treat beings as property. Scent at its best can disrupt patterns of violence and interrupt processes of extraction by centering care. While performing scent-based rituals with non-human animals, I acknowledge the violence of domestication. I work to insert care where and when I can, even if all I am able to offer is a temporary respite. This is perhaps why I look to scavengers as robust models for survival. Scavengers do their best with what is available. When working with non-human animals, my goals are not extractive, but collaborative. In this way, I see rituals of care within farming context as a form of harm reduction. While at an art residency in Maine, I worked with a group of Holstein cows over eight weeks. The cows were rented by the organization to serve as grazing pastoral decorations. Initially, the farmer told me that to prevent flies, they used a rope saturated in diesel fuel that was long enough to trail the backs of the cows passing through the barn. With permission of the farmer, I slowly befriended the cows by bringing them molasses grain every day. After a week, they came to me without being called and would follow me around the pasture. At that point, I was able to touch the cows and began spraying a natural bug spray on their bodies while brushing the encrusted feces off of their backs. Every day we took in calming notes of lemongrass, tea tree, eucalyptus, and rosemary oils with apple cider vinegar and castile soap. Every day we engaged in a group ritual of feeding and grooming. From my perspective, there was no real distinction between caregiver and receiver during our time together. Our daily rituals of mutual care were an act of solidarity between myself and the Holstein cows that I grew to love. These rituals were a way of stating that you and I are much more than either an ornament or a worker, that we are not only for breeding or milking. We are together not to herd or to lead, but just to walk, to have company, to understand the profound importance of committing daily to brushing the shit off the bodies of those you love and applying homemade remedies to soften the weight of being treated as property. We did not own each other. While working on an urban goat farm in Chicago, I also observed and engaged in various scented rituals of care. Within that context, I had much less autonomy and was required to follow the lead of the farmer. The goats were primarily for milking, 
However, it is important to be clear that the slaughter of kids or calves, biological males and older mothers is a part of any milk production cycle. Mastitis is a common infection on dairy farms. An infection of the udders, it can be caused by many factors, including contact with environmental contaminants like the milking machine or passed through familial exchanges between goats. It is a common problem that dairy farmers have to contend with because it lowers production and profits. Feeding raw garlic to the goats, as well as cleaning and massaging their udders with a minty balm is a common preventative practice. Another scent-based ritual of care included powdering the knees of each goat on the milking station with chrysanthemum powder. Chrysanthemum powder dried their knees, which were often wet with urine from sitting in their pen. The floral powder kept the flies away. Powdering the knees of each goat with ground flowers felt like a Baroque application of makeup. Barn cleaning is a common preventative practice of care. Methods vary based on the scale of each farm, but in this case, barn cleaning involved removing urine-soaked cardboard with the strong smell of ammonia. After the pens were clean, I would lay down fresh pine shavings. Deodorizing spaces through cleaning is a common gesture of care for non-human animals who do not have a choice where they rest, sleep, defecate, or spend their days. Outside of farming context, I also integrate scent while providing care for companion species in clients' homes. Before the pandemic, I had the privilege of working with a dog named Lady. They were abused for the first year of their life before being adopted by a kind family. The early trauma Lady endured means that they have many triggers. They are terrified of most human animals, especially male identifying people, in addition to sticks, loud noises, and abrupt movements. To get to know Lady and earn their trust, I paired calming scents with heart chakra meditations. My goals were to establish a calm space for our time together and to learn more about Lady's preferences. When Lady is excited, they make a low grunting noise, so I use that as an indicator of their individual preferences. Lemongrass and neroli seem to be two of Lady's favorite scents. Other scents that are calming for domesticated companions include valerian root, chamomile, clary sage, and lavender. When I go to Lady's home, I wear lemongrass as a scented signal to cultivate familiarity and calm. Working as a caregiver for non-human animals also requires that I manage my own emotional energy. If I am not calm, it negatively affects the beings that I care for. The necessity of caring for myself in order to show up for non-human animals is something that took a long time to learn. Unlearning negative training techniques has also been an important part of my ongoing re-education as an animal socialized by human animals. We live in a culture where trainers use toxic behaviors such as dominance or advocate for the use of prong collars in their methods. It is my goal to integ integrate rituals of care that are about reciprocity and relationship building between animals. Based on my experiences working with non-human animals, I strongly believe that positive reinforcement is the most effective tool for working with animals, both human and non-human. Using positive reinforcement, we focus on what we would like to see manifest. With positive reinforcement, we teach others how to treat us. And scent can be its own positive reward for dogs like Lady or human animals like myself who love to smell. Rituals of scent with non-human animals often coincide with rituals of touch. Introducing a calming scent is a transition that can lead to touch. For example, if a dog is uncomfortable with strangers, but I need to put on their harness, the scent of a treat can aid that process safely for both of us. My favorite training tool for anxious, hyper, or reactive dogs is touch. Using the dog's favorite treat to scent your hand, you can ask them to touch your palm with their nose and then give them a treat when they do. Touch can be an important recentering tool for distracted dogs. In more abstract terms, beings are always touching when they are taking the sense of the room into their bodies together. Touch and scent allow for the possibility of interspecies communication without a shared verbal or textual language. As Constance Klassen writes in The Deepest Sense, A Cultural History of Touch, a lack of words does not mean a lack of feelings or social, social significance. Like scent, many feelings are ineffable, or at least very difficult to translate into the languages of human animals. Klassen states that engaging with scent sensitizes us to the multiple ways in which animals communicate and express themselves 
through non-linguistic modalities. While I was doing scent research to repel the bear on the farm in Vermont, I also engaged in daily grooming rituals with three sheep, Luna, Aurora, and Juniper, to remove burrs that had accumulated in their wool. While I applied bug spray to the cows in Maine, they crowded around a salt lick, carving the object with their tongues. This inspired further interspecies collaborations. Scent and touch often coincide, signaling an encounter with another animal. Care should be specific to the sensory, physical, and social needs of each individual being that we encounter. In this discussion of care, it is crucial to be honest about the ways that I am both critical and complicit in fraught systems of pleasure. My truly voracious enjoyment of scent may cause a space to become inaccessible for those with chemical sensitivities or other scent sensitivities. Leah Lakshmi pipes now Samsara Singha's vital text, Care Work, Dreaming Disability Justice, has been an instructive tool to think about care and accessibility. They write, love in action is when we strategize to create cross disability access spaces. Why am I fighting so hard for a fragrance free space or ramp if that's not something I personally need? When disabled people get free, everyone gets free. When you work to make space is accessible, you can come from a deep, profound place of love. Making space accessible while engaging in scent work is still something that I'm learning to navigate as an artist who strives but often fails to be respectful of everyone's needs. Claudette, an Icelandic chicken living on a farm in Vermont, also caused me to consider questions of ableism and care more deeply. Claudette broke their leg at the joint after flying into the chicken wire fencing around their coop. Now Claudette uses their wings to balance as they hop, curiously exploring the local environment. On this small farm, Claudette has a special space and is able to move freely. Every day they are taken out of the coop and placed in a protected outdoor area with ample space and feed away from the roosters. At night, Claudette is carried into the coop and put into bed with the rest of the chickens and the ducks. On an industrial farm or under the care of a less compassionate small farmer, Claudette would have been slaughtered after their leg was injured. Claudette is a living being full of vitality, not a unit of weight and measure. It is essential to carve out accessible spaces for beings like Claudette, not to fix them, but to meet their needs as kin, to understand the important ways that beings of all abilities are innovative, thriving, and just simply living their lives. Making space accessible means respecting the unique sensory needs of each being that we are sharing space with. Joanna Hedva talks about the politics of care when they write, the most anti-capitalist protest is to care for another and to care for yourself. A politics of care means honoring the needs of oneself and every human in the room, including people of color, crip people and queer people. Disrupting long cycles of abuse means including non-human animals within frameworks of care and kinship. Decentering the desires of the most privileged members of society means that our society would not only look, but smell and feel entirely different. We could make room for a range of senses. I think it would be beautiful. If we believe, as Elaine Scarry explains in On Beauty and Being Just, that beauty leads to justice because it reproduces itself, then perhaps we can explore the polyvalence of beauty. I imagine that my version of beauty smells somewhat different than yours and that your version of beauty smells different than Claudette's or Lady's or Seed's version of beauty. How we each receive and respond to beauty as unique animals might produce a kaleidoscopic effect of beautiful sensory experiences that can be received in many ways by many species. Some gestures of beauty are certainly imperceptible to humans, such as the scent-based gender bending of the fruit flies discussed earlier. Scent explorations are opportunities to get to know the sensorium, or as Uxel put it, the equally perfect yet distinct perceptual spheres of each being with whom we come into intentional contact. Scent-based practices of care are political gestures because they celebrate a diverse and entangled array of animal sensoriums. Thank you for your time. Wow, that was um, uh, a really powerful, and you know, the work just strikes me as, as so important, you know, operating at this place that's an intersection of aesthetics and ethics. And I guess the first 
um, thing that I would just like to maybe circle back around to, even though you, you spoke about it beautifully and, and thoroughly is just the way in which your work uh, challenges the kind of the primacy of vision um, as an aesthetic, right? So I think what, what's, what interests me about your work is that there are um, other senses or you know, these sort of diverse sensoria that you, that you reference that are equally as powerful and, and important in our lives but are given um, um, less value, I suppose. And I guess that quote from Von Uxkul at the end, uh, where he said the equally perfect yet distinct uh, perceptual fields. I mean, this is such a, a powerful phrasing of that idea of sort of decentering and really challenging the primacy of vision. And so I don't know if you could just maybe speak a little bit more about the way in which these other uh, sensoria sort of appear in your work or, or influence your, your thinking? Yeah, um, thank you for that question. It's, um, it's something I obviously am really invested in is, is thinking about the multiple ways in which um, beings communicate and the ways in which um, those, those things are, you know, there's a lot of visual communication that occurs between species when you're interacting with non-human animals, but there's also so much that is, um, not visual and that is felt. And I think the kind of felt experience of working with non-human animals is part of what drives me to do this work as well. And so thinking about, you know, various sensory modalities, um, I think feels just um, kind of crucial to, to acknowledging the multiple languages that we're working with when we're spending time with non-human animals. Um, and then also I think in the kind of ocular centrism of art reception, there's a lot of senses that we've excluded. And, and it also means that we've excluded a lot of humans in that, um, you know, in the creation of those spaces. And so I'm really interested in, you know, what it would mean to bring touch back into spaces that have intentionally, for a lot of practical reasons, admittedly, but um, intentionally eliminated touch as part of the experience of seeing art. And I think also as someone who makes sculpture, um, you know, they're very, the, the appeal of sculpture to me is very uh, much about tactility. And um, so I think that, that allowing people to participate in actually like the making of the sculpture through the touching of the object and the reshaping of the patina feels really akin to also the way that I collaborate with non-human animals. So to me, it also kind of um, working with multiple senses um, both scent and touch and vision um, really allows to create like kind of a bridge between species in some ways. Yeah, that's, um, and there's like this sort of like history of intellectualism that's tied to vision that's that's problematic within the academies as well there. Um, and one thing I couldn't help but think about, and God knows we don't need to like rehash the story of Derrida and his cat, but like that there's some shame that's sort of involved with being a human animal and, and acknowledging one's animality you know, in, in the case of Derrida's story, it was just through the, the, the state of being naked, of, of bearing one's body. Um, but it seems like, especially when you were speaking about how perfumes are used to, to sort of mask our own old odors. Um, and so I wonder if like part of our tendency to uh, mistreat other animals in terms of extracting materials from their bodies in order to, to mask our own um, odors, has like this shame behind it, like that there's some, whether this is like Judeo-Christian or whatever sort of background drives this belief, but that the animal part of us is something to be ashamed of and, and covered up, frankly. And so I wonder if, if you think about, um, about shame or about, I don't know, the ways in which humans are really the only species who tries to deny its own um, you know, animal nature. Yeah, that's really interesting. I um, I think one thing that's really interesting about shame when it comes to this sense and the extraction of like um, musks or fecal odors from non-human animals is that it's also like replacing our own kind of like, you know, human, human animal odors with non-human odors. And so it's, it's both like, I, I think it, there's both some shame components, but also like a kind of appropriating of non-human animal like sexuality that is really complicated and um it's something i haven't like spent a lot of time really unpacking but um i think that displacement is really complex 
And um, I also think shame is um, a part of the way that we, we sort of use language to dis distance ourselves from non-human animals. And, um, you know, I, that's why I tend to try to be really intentional about, about the way that I talk about animals and the kind of bridge between humans and non-humans. But it's something I'd like to think more about. It's a really good question. <laughs> Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, and then the other, the other thing, and this is just out of my own uh, interests and backgrounds, was uh, talking about how zoos use odor as a way of like this additional layer of artifice, right? So zoo enclosures, um, and I have a sabbatical project next spring to to do some do some uh, research, but but zoo enclosures really, you know, are this ultimate attempt, as you said, to truncate a habitat, right? To, tr to truncate an ecosystem and take an animal's experience and cycle it through like, you know, a human sort of intellect and then refeed it to the animal as though they wouldn't know the difference between a, a, um, a stone and concrete pour to look like a stone, um, a, a, a pond and a carefully conditioned, you know, artificial, um, water water hole in their in their enclosure that animals don't know the difference and therefore we can sort of feed them this artificial environment in which they um, can exist for our entertainment as you said but the the inclusion of scent there is something that I never really considered um, not only that when you do go to a zoo um, if you go to zoos uh, that there is a, a, a powerful aroma that mixes both like the animal sense with like, you know, popcorn and hot dogs at the stands. It's just a very strange place to smell. And um, I never really considered this um, use of cologne uh, in the way that you described it. And so, I don't know, are there other examples of that? Is it, or is there anything else you could say about like how smell um, sort of reinforces that sort of art artificial experience at the zoo? Yeah, um, well, first of all, I would, I would love to, um hear more about your sabbatical project when that is, it gets going. So let me know, but um, the, I'm working on this project with the Carolina tiger rescue where that's a sanctuary. So it's, it's a different context from a zoo, but there's also, I think it's just um, in, in environments where the territory is so, so narrowed, um, finding other ways to engage the senses feels really important. And so even in the context of a sanctuary where you know, I think that they're trying to perform some harm reduction. Um, they'll get uh, donations of perfume from anyone who has like excess perfume and the stinkiest ones are like the, the tiger's favorites. <laughs> um, and so with, with that collaboration with the sanctuary, um, I'm working on casting one of the enrichment tools that the tigers have carved with their um, claws um, that was also sprayed with perfume. And then I'll spray that casting with perfume as well. So I'm not, I guess I'm not really answering your question about zoos very much, um, but I, I'm really interested in the ways that enrichment programs really expand the, the sensory territory for non-human animals. And um, that, that, that also is something that is performed in sanctuaries where there's harm reduction being performed, but this, the territory is still limited because of the ways that those non-human animals have been used for human animal entertainment before they came to the sanctuary. Yeah, I think you answered a much more interesting question than the one I asked, so that's totally fine. Um, so, and then, you know, to, to, you, you brought up politics of care there and, you know, um, veganism is something that I'm, I'm, I think is really important to educate uh, my students about. And we talk about, it. I teach a class about, about, um, about animals in the history of art. And so of course it has this sort of like critical animal studies undertone to it. But I wonder for um, maybe some of our students who are, you know, 18, 19, 20, just really coming um, into a world in which they're being exposed to more ideas about the ethics of care, particularly towards animals um, or, you know, towards um, otherly able people in the world generally. Um, I wonder like what you might say to um, artists who are just beginning studio practices or artists, you know, who have active studio practices already and how they might uh, shift their practices or, uh, or, or re rethink their practices in a, in a way to engage um, a politics of care within their, within their studio practice or within their writing or, or any of it? That's a really good question. I mean, it's something I 
grapple with continuously because I think as I tried to sort of touch on throughout the talk, as much as I try to insert care, there's also like the sort of persistence of violence feels ever present in like, you know, any gesture <laughs> from buying strawberries at the grocery store in the middle of winter to, uh, you know, buying um, hydrocal to cast a sculpture that mice have carved. And so I think that like, from my perspective, it feels important to be honest about the ways that to, to really critically examine the ways that we're participating in violence and then also try to think about ways we could insert care into those structures in order to mitigate some of that violence. And I think also from my perspective, um, as someone who works with a lot of what I consider like very alive materials, um, you know, I like to think about them as collaborators and active agents, not just non-human animals, but bacteria and microorganisms and, you know, everything that goes into to making a clay body do what it does. Um, all of those elements are, you know, physically participating in the production of sculpture with me. And so I try to sort of respect them as I'm drying out a form or doing something like that. I think really slowing down um, is maybe my most succinct advice is like slowing down, examining the ways in which we might be performing violence and then doing what we can while also acknowledging that um, we live in a really complex society where it's difficult to be entirely uh, ethical at all times. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's that's great advice, and thank you for that. And then finally, just you know, like, what's next? What do you have coming up? What are you working on now? Um, anything you want to plug? That, that kind of thing. What are you really excited about that's coming up for you? This fall, I have two shows, which you mentioned: one at UNCC and um, one at Roots and Culture. And so um, those feel it feels like you know I, I've spent the past. Uh, year or so making all that work and so just digesting that feels important um and then the thing I would plug is the the book um that came out in June um olfactory art and the political and age of resistance um there are incredible essays by many writers in that text so um it's not really just it's not really a plug for me but just for like really good reading Excellent. Thank you so much. And thanks for joining us and your time and your work today and your care, really. Uh, it, it feels uh, refreshing and, and, and much needed in the world. So thank you. And thanks to everybody for joining us for this um, event from our Visiting Artist Series. And we will see you at the next one.